and all hell seemed to break loose. The man had to explain why he was carrying his bed. And Jesus had to explain that God never stops doing good. And we pick it up from here in John 5, 12 to 24. It's on the monitor this morning if you don't have your Bible. Amen? They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your bed and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again, which means at one time he was in good health. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Jesus doesn't tell us what the man's sins were, but we have an indication with the next verse. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him and made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Those are misguided ethics and wrong priorities. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working, because nothing shall interrupt the work of God. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives, life, gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Very truly I tell you, Whoever hears my words and believes on him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. In this passage, we see different issues and problems which must be addressed. The man who was healed after 38 years of illness encounters opposition for carrying a mat on the Sabbath day. He was just happy to be healed. It was the first time he had rejoiced in a very, very long time. God wants us well. Amen? It is our time to be free. It was his time of deliverance. 3 John 1 and 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. God does not want us sick. He wants us well. And don't believe it when somebody tells you this ailment must be his will for your life. Have you ever heard that before? This man's healing was greater than winning the World Cup or the World Series. This was his day for, of deliverance from bondage. And the Jewish leaders of the day never asked him, what were you healed from? And how long were you sick? They never proclaimed, what a great miracle. All they cared about was that this man was carrying his bed on the Sabbath day. They were concerned about their rules and regulations being broken, even if it meant they were overlooking God's love and his grace and his mercy and compassion. In church, we must begin to love one another. John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Some rules are meant to be broken because they do not represent the liberty that we have in Christ. There are many carnal rules even today, and they create bondage. How can a heart say, God is my Father, and yet be so cold? How can we be so blinded by agendas that we miss God and what he is saying to us altogether? That's where the problem lies. Religious people will kill you if you mess with their agenda and their rules. 
Those who have a personal relationship with God will love you because they have humbled themselves to a point of being dead in the flesh and alive in the spirit. We must be born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Could you imagine that no one acknowledged that a great miracle took place and no one gave thanks or glorified God that there arose a great leader amongst them in Israel? We must ask, what then were their priorities? Why would they continue going through a routine uh, of worship if they did not believe in the God that they worshipped or they did not believe in a God of power? He was and is a God of deliverance and miracles. There was a lack of belief amongst the leaders and they steered the people the wrong way. In essence, it became a me first my agenda first, my way first, my importance in society first, and God second. And we look around today and realize that things have not changed much concerning men's hearts. We are technically much more advanced. We've been to the moon and back and invented all kinds of things which would have been impossible to believe just a few years ago. And yet men's hearts have not changed. It is still a me first society. So they missed the mark because of their own importance and their own agendas and ego and pride. Thank God that Jesus broke the rules. Amen? There was something else being broken that day. Mental, spiritual, and physical chains were being broken off that man who was sick as he picked up his bed and walked. Maybe that's why Jesus told them to do it. Amen? Hallelujah. So we must ask, are we willing to humble ourselves to believe all that God has for us? Can we humble ourselves to believe the impossible and the improbable because we serve a God that doesn't know any bounds? His mercy never comes to an end. And Jesus' way of living and his teachings would have set the people free. It would have set the leaders free, but they refused to open their heart to his love desiring instead to kill a holy man for doing good on the Sabbath. Now, there's a sister that said, get past your past. Someone like the Apostle Paul had to get past his murdering past to get into his future with Jesus. Amen? And there's a problem with calling evil good and good evil, which happens today. The leaders forgot something very important. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mark 2.27. How well do we see ourselves? How well do we examine our hearts? We look in the mirror to do our hair, but we must look in the mirror to do our hearts as well. Are we examining our actions and our words? People know you're a Christian. They see you all dressed up coming to church to worship. They see you shining the car on Saturday to get prepared for Sunday. Amen? Do we take the same spirit of worship home with us that we have in church? The highway to destruction is wide, and God warns, take the narrow road, remove the legalities, and be set free. These religious people thought there was no way they could miss heaven. They believed Abraham and Moses would open the door wide for them. So many people today feel there is no way I could miss heaven. After all, I do good. I'm a good person. I sponsored two children in Africa and perhaps in South America. Good works are always welcome, but they don't save you. The question is, have you repented of your past? Did you surrender your life to Jesus? Are you living for Jesus? Is he your purpose day and night? The people claim to be Abraham's seed and followers of Moses, and yet they had a spirit of murder. Let the thief go free and kill the holy man who heals on the Sabbath day. So Jesus told them what they were thinking is the opposite of how God thinks. He wanted them to get the right heart condition. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I'm not on the monitor today. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Even today misconceptions about God's priorities lead many astray. His priority is that we first believe in him and then have a relationship with him as sons and daughters. The man who was healed had sin, 
and illness in his life. The son of all authority healed him and set him free. He found him again, and he told him something peculiar when he found him in the temple. Verse 14. After a while, Jesus met him in the temple and said, Now you are well again. But now you are well again, but do not sin anymore, or something worse may happen to you. So this man was once well, but found himself ill for 38 years. And the Bible does not go into detail, but the man himself knew what Jesus was talking about. Maybe his weakness was gossip, because no sooner had he left Jesus did he run to tell the Jewish leaders and say, it was Jesus who healed me, whether positive or negative. At this, they should have been rejoicing. But it stirred the religious crowd the wrong way because of their heart condition. They were agitated. They got bitter and angry. And some people don't need to know everything you know. This is where wisdom and common sense comes in. The wise men didn't go back to tell King Herod after visiting a young Jesus where he was. They went by a different way. Amen? The scripture says, for this reason, the Jews wanted to get rid of Jesus. They wanted to kill him. Yet, Jesus reasoned with them about the father and the son relationship because his greatest desire is that no one would perish. The healed man could have reasoned to himself and said, this time, I'm going to ask God, what is his will for my life? Stop what causes your problem. After all, it's always good to ask God his will for your life because he's concerned about every detail in your life. And Jesus said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come. And Jesus said it for a reason. The question is, and we must ask, what direction must I take to live right and sin no more? How can I live with a righteous resolve and right motives? If you sin, then repent right away and do not stay in condemnation. Jesus has forgiven us. And some people beat themselves up for years after. Amen? You have been forgiven. Move on. The, uh, the word in 1 John 3 and 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is an encouragement that we can all have a holy life because of what Jesus did. Not because of what we did. Amen? We do not live under condemnation any longer. We have many chances to make right choices. That comes by asking God to guide us in the way that we should go. Have we asked Jesus which way to go? And I heard a pastor tell a story. People have uprooted themselves and their children from good schools and a good church because they got a raise. A company wanted to give them a new position. Amen? And now their kids who had a solid church foundation, have gone with the wrong crowds. They're into drugs. The family has fallen apart. We need to ask God which direction to take. Amen? The church's support and foundation means more than you could imagine. And many times we pay a price that we don't need to pay. In my early walk with Christ, I received a gift from a ministry, and it simply said, grow where you are planted. Amen? Very simple words but very profound words. Ask God and he will guide you into that victorious life. Grow where he plants you. Get some deep roots into the ground where you are. John 5, 22 and 23. For the Father judges no one. He has entrusted all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. Whoever refuses honor to the Son refuses honor to the Father who sent him. These are very direct words. Truth be told, Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in him. They are God, and the Son has been given all authority. Matthew 28, 18 to 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. You know how big heaven is? Amen? There's trillions of galaxies. All but was created by God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ye therefore and tell all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. How then can anyone enter into the kingdom of heaven without Jesus? It's an impossibility. 
John 10 and 1, Very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, and Jesus is the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Thieves and robbers don't get into heaven. Amen? While we're here, we have a chance to turn from the way we used to be. The religious Jews thought they were serving God the right way, but in essence, they rejected his teachings. Religion will kill you and your hopes of truly serving God the right way. You must have a personal relationship with Jesus. You should note the man who was ill, again, was there for 38 years with nobody to help him. Amen? The, day, the very day he gets healed, controversy comes into his life. Because the enemy does not like it when you are set free. It agitates them. He wants to keep us bound. He wants to keep us sick and depressed. Amen? And then blame God for your problem. There's a battle raging on, brothers and sisters. No one said this walk is going to be easy. Yet the Lord overcame and we shall overcome. He says life and death is in the power of the tongue. You have to speak to your situations. We can speak life, we can speak healing and blessing and protection and so many other things into our lives with the tongue. You can also speak and command any ailment you have to leave and never return. Jesus is life. He came to give it more abundantly. Amen? And the world without Jesus has no hope, just like this man in our scripture today had no hope. And this set the stage for Jesus to do something miraculous. And many times we need that divine intervention into, in our lives. God is a God of miracles. And many times he waits on us to stand in agreement. Again, Jesus wants us well. And he wants us set free from chains of bondage. There was a woman who was uh, giving her testimony on TV. And she had spent $300,000 on medication from things derived from her childhood. And she heard a minister on TV that says, that was taken care of 2,000 years ago. You need to speak to your problems. Speak the scripture to yourself. Cast it out. And she went throughout her house just speaking that word day and night until she was delivered for free. Amen? Because it's already in the scripture. The church is supposed to heal the sick, Mark 16 and 8. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. The man only began to walk again after a direct divine intervention from Jesus. But before that, where was the church? The story teaches us about the goodness of God and the foolishness of carnal men. It clarifies a whole lot of things about how God works for good despite the opposition of so-called holy religious people. That's why we must judge people by their actions and their fruits, not by their lip service, which has gotten us in trouble. If it was lip service, there could be books written up to the sky. Amen? <clears throat> John 10:38. Uh, but if I do them uh, and, you don't, and you don't believe me, believe the works so that you can know and recognize that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. He was, of course, talking about his works and the good fruits that they were seeing. We may have trusted somebody's words, but found out their fruits are rotten. How many times have people used the shield of Christianity to outright lie? to you for gain forgive them move on amen let the past be the past but there are many like that that come in the name of Jesus only to take something from you that they need amen so our spiritual eyes also have to be open the scriptures show us uh, man's short-sightedness when it comes to the mercy of God the Jewish leaders in our sermon got caught up in man-made laws and the tragedy is that people went down the same ditch with them. Matthew 15 and 14. And Jesus said, ignore them. They are blind guides to the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into the ditch. And Jesus is talking about spiritual blindness. 
And he shows us if you want to have 2020 spiritual vision, then you must receive the son of all authority. And how many times do you see someone who is lame suddenly pick up their mat and start to walk away? It doesn't happen. Tell somebody, that's my God. He's able. Yes, he is our healer. He is our blesser. He is the lifter up of our head. And Jesus healed me and made me whole again. Hallelujah. That goes for every one of us. Amen? Proclaim your healing. The man who was healed went back to tell the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. John 5.16. And it was because he did things like this on the Sabbath day that the Jews began to harass Jesus. You would think there would be a celebration with rejoicing that healings were taking place. But the opposite was true. There was talk of killing this righteous man who did good. The Pharisees had it wrong. After thousands of years, do the majority of churches have it right today? Who were the leaders really serving? Jesus was there to break molds and traditions. Isaiah 61 and 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And Jesus broke their rules and did good on the Sabbath no matter what. And the more he broke their rules and, and traditions, the more Pepto-Bismol and Tylenol they needed. Amen? They were upset. He gave them a headache. John 5.17 His answer to them was, My father still goes on working and I am at work too. But that only made the Jews even more intent on killing him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he spoke of God as his father and so made himself equal with God. The fact is truth was spoken and the kingdom of darkness again was agitated because of the unity with God the Father. And the more light that comes into the world, the more crazy it's going to seem. Amen? Doing good and bringing God's light agitates the kingdom of darkness in any generation, not just this generation. Luke 1, and 47. And Mary said, My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. They had it right. Jesus is God. He is known as the Word or the Son after coming to earth. And he is equal with God, but there was a problem. And it was with the religious leaders of that day. Psalm 33 and 18. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope in his unfailing love. Though they saw the miracles and heard life-changing words, words, they didn't believe in the Son. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Amen? Faith in what was seen and faith in what was heard should have made a difference, but their hearts were hardened. And there comes a point in time that we must know who is the king of all authority because he rules and he reigns forever. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Society has a hard time believing that today, but the church should not because it's in the scripture and it will surely come to pass. And... We were discussing that on Saturday. Amen? That they're trying to shut down the Bible in certain states. And they don't tell you overtly out in the public. They come under the radar to do their business. Amen? We have to be in high prayer today. Pharaoh once asked, who is God? And he found out as Moses walked out with all of Israel. Amen? And his armies were destroyed. How many times do you see hardened hearts today? They saw the wonders and the miracles. They heard the words that moved their heart, and yet they will not come. And they even criticize those who bring the words of life. I can tell you with certainty that there is no dead person who does not know that Jesus is Lord of all. Every year people go home to eternity, and the many who reject the gospel do not make it into his kingdom even though they thought they did good. Why go into damnation if you can go into life forevermore? Luke 16, 31. But Abraham said, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, 
they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. These things are addressed. The king of all authority gives life. It's in the scripture. People would love to come back from hell to tell their family, listen, hell is real. Don't come to this place. We have the example with the rich man and Lazarus. Amen? We see the signs of the times everywhere. Jesus is the son of of authority and he will come back and it won't be long it's up to us to be ready if he came back today would the worldwide church be ready men are questioning God as they did when Jesus walked the earth and preached and healed and did all manner of good preaching the good news everywhere so again here is someone who was sick for a long time giving a testimony as to what God did for them and they basically said sit down stop carrying that mat of yours and be quiet right you're making too much waves you're disturbing our peace John 5 and 9 to this Jesus replied in all truth I tell you by himself the son can do nothing he can only do what he sees the father doing and whatever the father does the son does for the father loves the son and shows him everything that he himself does and he will show them even greater things than these, works that will astonish you. Jesus is our solution for everything under the sun. Some people say, if God is good, why are so many people suffering or sick? God, do something. There is a song by Matthew West that asked the question. And God answers and says in the song, I did something. I created you. And I'm going to read some of those lyrics, if you'll bear with me. Amen? I woke up this morning and saw a world full of trouble now. Thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty. Children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me so... I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? He said, I did. I created you. If not us, then who? If not me and you right now, it's time for us to do something. If not now, then when will we see an end to all this pain? It's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. So I'm tired of talking about how we are God's hands and feet, but it's easier to say than to be like, uh, like angels of apathy who tell ourselves, it's all right, somebody else will do something. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of life with no desire. I don't want a flame. I want a fire. I want to be the one who stands up and says, I am going to do something. We are the salt of the earth. We are the city on a hill. But we're never going to change the world. By standing still we won't we won't stand still amen we have the power to do something we have the power to move mountains but church the power is not in the cable news network amen it's not in the sports arena it's in the house of God it's in us the power is found on our knees in prayer and in reading and meditating on the Word of God what are we willing to lose in order to serve God better and to become better Christians? Are you willing to lose affiliations when you find out their rules and regulations are more important than God's word? Are you willing to lose club membership with all the privilege? Are you willing to lose unholy friends that will hurt your spiritual growth? Are you willing to walk away from the clique and the crowd that have the power and the prestige to rest on the power the anointing and the authority of Christ by himself the son can do nothing doesn't that statement amaze you but he has gone to be with the father and now they abide in us the hope of glory is in us Jesus does nothing unless it's in full and total agreement with the father that included going to the cross which was pre-planned to take away our sins he has now given us the power to tread on scorpions Luke 10 19 behold I give you power to tre tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy nothing shall by any means 
hurt you. Amen? We have the power over the enemy. And the enemy could be your ailment. The enemy could be your finances. Amen? And so many other things that you could speak to. Very little of the church uses the power entrusted to us by the Father and the Son. Now, a minister had gone swimming with his family. And as he relaxed in the sun, enjoying the day, and was thinking about an upcoming conference, he was a young healing minister. All of a sudden, his wife came running to him, saying something terrible has happened. And he got up wondering what's going on. And he heard a woman screaming, my boy, my boy. She was in shock. They were all in the water having fun when her son, who was also in the water, floated up lifeless. They pulled him out and tried mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, pushing out water from his chest. He was only about eight or nine years old. The ambulance arrived, and they were going to take the boy away. And the minister's wife looked at him and said, Do something. You have to do something. And he had never done this outside the church walls before. <clears throat> but he ran up to the mother, and he said, I'm a healing minister. Can I pray for your boy? And she said, yes. And he took her hand and with a loud voice commanded that his spirit would return and started to prophesy over that boy that he would be well and live a long, healthy life and decreed it to a ripe old age. All of a sudden, the boy who was lifeless in the ambulance being taken away, his eyes started to flutter. Then his eyes opened and they jumped out of the ambulance to say, he's alive. Hallelujah. No one could believe it. But that is the power of God. And it's not an isolated situation. What joy there was that day that a believer who had the authority canceled the plan of the devil to take away that young boy's life. Amen? And spoke life instead of death. And a few weeks later, they went back to that spot. And a relative of that boy who happened to be there said he is completely well and does not even remember ever drowning. Amen? That's God. Glory be to his name. Jesus said, my works will astonish you. So why are we so astonished when miracles happen? You and I must begin to be part of the miracle. Miracles should be a natural part of our lives. Why were the people so astonished that Jesus healed and showed them the right protocol on the Sabbath day? The protocol is we ought to do right all the time. Amen? Galatians 6 and 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Amen? Not just Christian. To all people, especially now do, to those who belong to the family of believers. Hallelujah. But we don't stop because they're not believers. Glory be to God. And we even do it on the Sabbath day, right? We're supposed to be the hands and the feet and the mouthpiece of Jesus doing good. The people of that day who had a humble heart received the message of Christ, but the religious people were filled with pride and anger and had murder again on their heart against the messenger. We always must remember who is the solution in our lives. Our lives are hid in Christ. Galatians 2.20 So I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Those who live by faith are set free with the liberty Christ gives us. But based on today's scripture, we see that many were bound by tradition. How many times has tradition gotten us in trouble with God? I've got to get with the family for this thing. Amen? And we're willing to forego a holy day in the household of God to do it. Tragically, the solution for all Israel and the Gentiles was right in front of them, teaching them as a great light in the darkness. But they questioned his every action and preferred their own way. Proverbs 29 and 1. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. This is the problem. We could be so steeped in our own ways that we no longer want to look to God's way of life for us. Again, another popular minister dressed up and disguised himself as a beggar outside his own church. 
No one in the congregation recognized him. And everyone passed him by, and some wanted him to leave the area. Amen? But he came to the pulpit later on, and the congregation was shocked as he revealed his true identity. And he said, you will do anything for me because of my position as a prophet. I prophesy to you and so forth, so you come to me. But what about when I was outside and you didn't know who I was? No one encouraged me. No one invited me to church. No one asked if I needed food or prayer. In fact, people looked down on me. And some even threatened to call the police if I didn't leave the area. Is this what church is all about? Isn't it about reaching the lost, the destitute, and helping others to be restored again? The congregation was convicted that day. Many had tears in their eyes. There was repentance in that church. We're called to do the work today, amen? God looks with favor upon those who help others. And he makes it clear in Scripture, Matthew 25, 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Helping others is a great part of the Christian life. The man who was healed received the love and compassion of God. Isn't that what the church is all about? And what the church should be doing? Jesus didn't look at that man's dirty clothes or worn out mat. He looked at a soul that needed God and a body that needed healing. I want us to understand that opposition will always come when light comes into the picture. Amen? The media is not on your side. Anytime there is an issue with a church or a minister has some type of controversy, they'll be all over it with negative news. But very few will talk about the good that the churches do in our society. There was a reporter that couldn't find anything, any story to really talk about, and she talked about a great church doing some great work, and she got fired. You could imagine, true story. But thank God, God had something greater and better for her in store. Amen? Whenever you do good and are getting effective results for the kingdom of Christ, expect opposition. The enemy is defeated because of the cross, and we must remind him and ourselves that we have the authority through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ every day. I'm sorry to say Christians who are not in tune with God will miss the great things that he is doing for us today and wants us to do as we step out in faith. This is the beginning of the kingdom age. And there will be turbulence because greater light is coming into the world. And it will agitate and confuse those who are living in darkness. This is the Father's timetable for the church to rise again and take back all that is ours for his glory. Amen? It shall be done. We have the victory because the Son of all authority has overcome this world. And we shall overcome. It's time to stand and proclaim what Jesus did for us. And I thank our blessed pastor for a great testimony last week as to what Jesus can do when you put your trust in him. He has done great things. Get out from the sidelines and get involved in the game. Engage in the work of Christ on earth. Don't worry about going to Africa to evangelize the people there if the people next door need to hear the gospel and receive your guidance. God will do exploits as we step out in faith. Put that faith in Jesus, the Son of all authority. Let us just bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Lord, we pray for those who have been left alone with no one to help them or to encourage them. I pray that the church would rise up to be the friend, the healer, and the light that our society needs. I pray that we could sh show the love and the light of Jesus wherever we go. Bless us to continue on this Christian journey and help us to continue to serve you in spirit and in truth. We give you praise and thanks. Amen. God bless you this morning, brothers.